I'm here to help you and encourage you. I want you to go with Jesus. Heather, I want you to fall in. Stop somewhere along the way by following somebody else. Don't let anybody else become to you. There's only one Lord. <laughs> Amen. His name is Jesus. He's your Lord and he's my Lord. He's our Lord. We've got to follow him. your walk is with him and not for people. And that's sort of the cutting line or the differentiation here with some of these with the people here he's saying do not be like them. It seems to be at least uh, one thing that we can say, I think we could agree upon here, is what they did, they were really not doing for the Lord. It sort of involved things that you could do for the Lord, but the real motive of doing it was to be seen of men. Even though it was religious things and right things, even though if somebody come up to you and, and, and they said, well, don't pray. Well, you know, you could say, well, that person is being a real, not very spiritual when they're telling you not to pray because everybody agrees that you should pray. You know, and yet Jesus, you see, comes along and says, in essence, it's not that he doesn't say don't pray, but in essence he says don't be like them, meaning don't, whatever you do in your heart, you're not doing it because of people. It's a step beyond. It is, as Ron says, again, sincerity, or what I call a matter of integrity, private, personal integrity which is a very sincere matter. You will notice if you continue to read on from, well, not just about prayer, but getting back on what Ronnie has brought up here, from chapter... Five, which is the Sermon on the Mount. It's like, I, I forget how many times, seven times or so on into chapter seven, he continually makes these, no, it's more, more than seven times, he continually makes these, these, these comparisons. Um, the first one starts in chapter 5 at verse 24. I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that is, a, is, a, is an extremely, that is not a statement of a man. That is the statement of God himself. That is a, that is a startling statement. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And then in verse 21, he starts this particular teaching that it says, You have heard that the ancients were told this and this, but I say unto you. You notice that? Verse 21 and 22. Get down to verse 27 and 23. 
You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks on a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, gentlemen, I don't know how that makes you feel. But I am very guilty in that area and have had and had and have had to repent and, and do repent in that area. That has been a, a continually ongoing kind of war in my life until finally. It's not that I never have a bad thought or a sexual thought or anything. That's far from the truth I do. But I had to take that serious. I had to take that statement very serious. You can't, you can't dust these things off. Um, verse 33, again, you have heard that the ancients were told, but I say to you, verse 33 and 34. So you see, all through this whole teaching of the Sermon on the Mounts here is this continual comparison. You have a comparison of the way people are and what they say and the line or the level that they want to live on and then the step that God is wanting you to take to live with Him. A matter of heart. And of course then when He comes to this matter of prayer, which we've been studying about prayer, the same spirit of those situations, the same spirit of all of those situations there, uh, uh, lust, um, adultery, murder, you know, it comes to murder, he says, you know, forgive me for paraphrasing this, but you go back and read it yourself. He says, you've heard that the ancients have said, and everybody says, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you even say to somebody they're a fool, if you even have that spirit in your heart where your spirit is injurious and you're looking at a person and you're demeaning to them and you're ridiculing, you're taking them or you're doing something that puts them down, in other words, calling them a fool. He says, you're guilty in the spirit. So, these are very serious things. So, the same kind of attitude we see about prayer. I made the comment last week. I think that um, if, you, if the only prayer you life, life you have or the only time you pray, pray is what happens when you get in church here how can I reconstruct that positive? <laughs> I don't know how to. I'm hoping that you have a, a, a secret time, place, time of prayer in your lives. That this duty when we meet together and come to church isn't the only exercise of, of uh, the only exercise of your spirit that God has quickened or given you in this new life that has given us this eternal life. <clears throat> did, that, did that sound better? <laughs> I hope that it did. All right. Anything else? I want you to, I know I got a big mouth, but I want to hear from you. How many of you read this this week? Not, maybe you didn't every day, but you really took it and began to look at it and read it and fool around with it. Okay. That's good. Now, I want to give you another reading assignment for this week. In your reading this week, I want you to read Psalms 51, whole Psalms, this week. Take that psalm and read it. How many of you know that psalm and what that psalm is about? That's David's prayer. That's when David's, after his uh, doings there, his sin, his failure, his fault, his any any way you like to say how bad he blew it there with Bathsheba, and uh, after Nathan the prophet came to him and told him that parable about the fellow that had one little ewe lamb and, and pointed out his sin to him. That is David's prayer to the Lord concerning that situation. I'd like for
ask you to take that psalm this week and uh, read through it. And read it, and then I'd like for you to pause. And I'd like you to ask the Lord something. I would like, well, this is pretty bold of me to say this, I'd like for you to ask him to show you if there's something in your life that you have never really come to him about, something that you never thought was really bad, you just sort of put it in the, well, people don't think that's a bad category. And so you never really took it to heart. Or I'd like for you to read that and ask him to search your mind, search your heart, look at you, and see if anything comes to your mind in your life that you've never really put under the blood of Christ. And if something comes to you, that's your opportunity between you and the Lord. Through the spirit of that psalm, through the spirit of that prayer, to claim that prayer read that psalm back out to the Lord and pray it to him and ask him to forgive you. How many of you do that this week? Psalm 51. Just take that psalm and read it and reflect on it this week for that will really, really help you. All right. Now, Heavenly Father, we're going to read this passage of scripture again that we've been reading together and you know the things that I have planned on saying and uh, even the notes that I have down here and you know we bow before you tonight again each and every one of us we've walked in here on purpose we've walked in here because we <coughs> want to love you we do love you we want to love you more we want things to change in our life. We want you to change us and to help us. Again, Lord, Mario is on my mind tonight. We want to be macho Christians. So we bow to you. Make this an eternal time in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we have, as you already know, Jesus' teaching about prayer. We said last week, and I'm going to reiterate on this again, everything that you may think about prayer, have read about prayer, or have been taught about prayer, if it comes in conflict or is not part of something that Jesus teaches, then let it go. No matter how reasonable it may have sound, if it's something about, if it's in your heart and you can see it, that it is, does not line up with what Jesus says about prayer, then let it go. Bring into captivity everything to the obedience of Christ, as it says in, it's in Philippians. If Jesus says it, even if it, even if all of your life there's been another thought or something and you've held to it, if you can see that it's counter or not right or isn't in sync or isn't part of the nucleus of what Jesus says about prayer, Get rid of it and hold on to what Jesus says and begin to try to work, do, and be what Jesus says about prayer, okay? I don't care how famous a preacher is. I don't care how many millions of people watch him on television. I don't care how big of a place he's got. I don't care how many thousands of people flock into that place. If he says something or is teaching something that is not with what Jesus has said, let it go. Get rid of it. Okay? Popularity doesn't count. Uh, the multitude, the majority, uh, in a democratic, we're a democratic people, and we think the majority is always right. You take a vote, the majority wins. Well, I want to tell you something. In the kingdom of God, that doesn't mean nothing. The majority is not right. 
There is one majority, and he's God himself. If there's 10 million people that want to argue with God, if God says something and 10 million people say the other, you better let 10 million people go and join with God, okay? Because uh, God's the majority, not popularity or anything else. So try to keep your heart, try to keep your mind, try to keep learning, pay attention to what Jesus says about subjects and about things. And when Jesus says something about prayer, begin to look at it, study it, think about it, look at the context all around it, try to get everything you can about it, talk to him about it, pray about it, ask him to teach you, read it over keep on and keep on and keep on until you begin to have some convictions in your heart that are your convictions. Okay? There's very, there's very few hills that I will die on. But there are a few hills, there are a few convictions in my life that I'm willing to die on. And the reason I'm willing to die on it is because I believe they are from the kingdom of God. And I cannot turn my back on Make sure you have those kind of hills about everything, all right? So we get to this matter, and that, that uh, we already see that he's warning about a, a religion. There's two kinds of religion. There's the outward religion, and then there's an inward religion. Of course, an inward religion produces an outward religion, but like so many other things, uh, Satan can be a part of the outward manifestations of things, even miracles and things like this. You remember when Moses went before um, Pharaoh and did all of those things and Pharaoh called in his magicians and the magicians did the same things that, the, that Moses did. Moses threw down his rod and it became a snake. Well, the magicians did the same thing. There's lots of counterfeit stuff. Scripture even says that, you know, the devil comes as an angel of light. And so that's why you've got to be born again, and that's why you've got to make the teachings of Jesus and what he says paramount in your life, not the systems of man. And as a pastor, this is one of the most difficult things that I have to do because so many times the things I say will run counter of a popular trend at the time, a teaching that's coming down the pike. And everybody sort of runs off into that teaching because it's got nice stuff and human nature likes it, but it's really not from God. So, <laughs> are y'all feeling me? You have got to get in this yourself. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. We've already made this comment about this passage of Scripture. If there's one thing prayer is, we know that it is not needs-centered. He knows what you have in need of before he asks. Sharon said tonight, that was very comforting. It is comforting. He does know what you have in need of before you ask. And let me tell you, tonight, everybody here, I believe, has met every one of your needs and more, for at least you were born an American. What if you were born in some other part of the country? where they don't have automobiles and they don't have all of this kind of stuff that we think is God and a blessing. How do you add it up? What do you do with the people that are that are in downtown Calcutta? That if they're fortunate, if they're fortunate, they own a wooden bowl I'm not making this up. I have a very close personal friend who's been in downtown Calcutta. You know where Mother Teresa worked. Been down there preaching crusades. Dr. Streeter Stewart. I hope to have him here to speak to you sometime. He's been in downtown Calcutta. There is a thriving, on fire, alive, dynamic, true Church of Jesus Christ in downtown Calcutta where they don't have TVs to watch where they don't have any steeples to wa uh, worship under, no nice pews to set in, no clock to watch so that you know when church is over. They have nothing. If they're lucky, they have a wooden bowl in which they hope to go to certain places and certain times in the city and get a bowl of rice, and they may have a bamboo mat that they roll out and they can sleep on it, that they can find a place to sleep. And those people are alive with faith to the point where once the kids get sick, or something happens that the church gathers around and they pray and they literally have miracles performed and the church is growing. They have no automobiles. They have none of the stuff that we think is a blessing. 
See, you see how culturized our idea of Christianity is. And the church is growing. People are coming to Christ. Like Aquinas said one time about the church, he said, the church can no longer say silver and gold have I none, but it also can no longer say rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. And there's a church down in Calcutta and other places that I don't know about, but I'm sure there is. I've heard of reports in China where the same thing is going on, but I've had eyewitness reports of people that I'm very close to who have been there, one man, one man, not people, one man, Dr. Streeter Stewart, who's been there and reported those things to me. He come back to change man. Prayer is not needs-based. Well, what do we pray for then? <laughs> By and large, most of us pray for our needs, certain needs that we have. But Jesus says, don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. So then prayer has to have a higher ambition or a higher purpose or something higher than saying the right things, pushing the right button, and getting what I want. That's most of the teaching that's going out there. There are seminars, there are men out there taking big money off of people, getting them in, trying to teach them what to pray so that how to pray so they can get their prayers answered. Voila, I mean, come here, let me get rich off of you. I'll teach you something because I know human nature and I know that human nature wants things and so we'll put it in a religious category. I'll get rich and fly my around my Learjets and I'll leave a waking mess of disappointed people behind me that the church is never going to hardly be able to reach because they're already so disillusioned with God that the gospel will not have any penetration because we've got a bunch of harlots out there today. And prayer is one of the things that they're keying on. And it's all needs-based. Jesus says prayer is not needs-based. Pray then in this way, he says. Our Father. Okay. If it's not needs-based, then the first thing out of his mouth, if, if it's not needs-based, then there must be a higher agenda, something beyond give me, give me, give me, which is part of human nature. How many of you parents in here, what's one of the first things about your kids you ever notice about them? Give me, give me, give me, give me. <coughs> right? <coughs> this is not a knock. This is not anything. I'm just saying. My daughter goes out the door every morning. Every morning when she goes out the door, she says, Dad, you got $2 for lunch. Same thing every morning. I say to her, get a job. And I give her $2. What am I to her? I don't know, but I'll tell you one thing. I am to her. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. But yet, in this relationship, there's a higher agenda. She calls me her father. It speaks of a relationship. Now let's think about this relationship. What did this relationship with the sovereign almighty God cost you? Did it cost you your firstborn? What did it cost you? Not a thing. What did it cost him? Yes. And this cheapened mentality that we have of prayer. You come in prayer, there ought to be something inside of you that is trying to get this wonder that you can be there with a God that has spoke everything into existence, that's made everything there is. That's made the DNA in you that is made beyond anything that we can think of. This God looked inside of us, knew that we had sin inside of us, which he can't tolerate, which is something we can't even fathom. And he himself made this.
this relationship for us that we could even dare say our Father. You get on your knees to pray, there ought to be such a great appreciation in your heart that you even have the privilege that there is a God that can look on your heart because of the blood of Jesus Christ. This praying is not a cheap thing. It's a wonder. This is God saying this to his, to his disciples. Jesus, God, the man. Fully man, fully God. Only God could be a complete man and a complete God. Only God. And he says, listen, you got a crowd over here that's pretty religious. Look at me. I pay my tithe. I'm faithful to church. I do this. Bless God, man. If this whole community was like me, why, things would be better around here. Outfit. You know, the kind that when somebody falls, they go. God says, <laughs> don't be like them. They pray. So they can be seen. You know what? They've got their reward. This is it. And don't be like the other crowd over there. They're not religious, but they've got it all worked out themselves. They've got their own brand of religion. What they think is true. And they think they're going to be heard by their many words. They, they're going to hoodwink God. <coughs> don't be like them. In fact, when you pray... I want you to know praying ain't even really, truly praying, praying ain't even a public thing. This is Jesus teaching, folks. Don't throw stones at me. You can read it yourself. You go in the secret room, and it's not about needs. He knows what you have in need of before he asks. It's a higher agenda. Pray then in this way. Just try to think about that. It's just awesome. Just try to even think about our Father. That we could say our Father. You know who we're talking about. We're not talking about a human father. We're not talking about daddy. We're not talking about our Father. Where's he at? Who are you? Where? In heaven. Prayer isn't an earthly thing. I can't teach you pray. I can't teach you about prayer. I said last week, if you want to learn how to pray, pray. If you want to learn how to be a good carpenter, get with a crew and get out there on a job and bust a few nails, bust a few thumbs, get a hammer in your hand, work with somebody that knows, pretty soon you'll begin to catch on. Pretty soon, eventually, you'll become a good carpenter. If you try to go into a classroom and teach some kid how to be a carpenter by drawing stuff on the blackboard, wow. That don't mean he can drive a nail straight. There's only one way you're going to be able to drive a nail straight. Get a, get a hammer in your hand and get out there and drive a few thousand nails. Pretty soon you'll be able to drive one straight. Right? You want to learn how to pray? Then you're going to have to make God a priority in your life. You're going to have to realize that he loves you and wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to be called the Father, this God that costs him everything to give you this privilege. And get alone with him and get to know him. And quit being so childish that you're, every time you come to God, you're in trouble and you want bailed out because that's your need. Learn to love God and know God so that you don't get into trouble. My dad was not a Christian. But I really have to thank my dad for helping me spiritually. If I ever got in trouble, I'll tell you who I would not call. Now you say he wasn't a good father. If I got in trouble or something, that my dad would have been there. 
What he was talking about was particularly jail. He told me, you ever get in jail? Don't call me. I'm the one that's taught you how to stay out of there. <coughs> so I remember one time my brother got thrown in jail. He was about 17 years old. That would have made me about 19, I guess. He had an old 51 Chevrolet, and him and a whole bunch of boys got in that car, and they had one of these battery-operated uh, emergency light things that had like a suction thing on it. And so they whipped that out there on the top of the car and turned it on, and all of them got in harmony. With all the windows down, all of them got in harmony. You know, it sounded like a cop, and they was coming up behind people, all doing that out the windows, and people were pulling over. Man, they thought they were having a real good time till they come up behind an unmarked car. They all ended up in jail for impersonating an officer. All the other boys got out of jail except for one little Benny Joe King. Because he wasn't about to call dad. He had a brother who stayed in jail. Now, is God like that? There's consequences to sin. God's already told you what they're going to be. You say, that's not a loving God. I think it's a pretty loving God that has told you beginning from the end and through the blood of Jesus Christ has made a way for you. To God, it's a step of faith. It's a witness that you can declare before people and before the devil and please God. It's something that you can do. sometimes it burns dimly it doesn't burn as bright as I want it to burn in my own heart the voices from all over call to me I get mixed up and confused please see that I'm trusting you I'm trusting you when I don't know how to trust I'm trusting you when I have nothing you are all that we have this morning encourage us and strengthen us Holy Spirit thy power and thy might. Do a spiritual work in our hearts, Lord. Revive your church. Help us, Jesus. We call out to you. We call out in the name of the Lord. We call to you. Thank you for this time together, for this moment, this point, this time in grace, which has been ours to be together. Holy Spirit, I pray your richest blessing upon every heart that's here. Thank you for never letting go. Thank you, God. Thank you. It's in your name that we've met, preached, and prayed, and participated in the name of Jesus. There is no other name under heaven and earth by which man shall be saved. In the name of Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed. Sweetheart, come play the piano. There's a there's a brook running down through here. This is called the Brookside Westland Church. There's a brook running right down this church right here this morning. And maybe some of you would like to come up here and pick up a few rocks for your sling. Would you do that? If you want to, if you could. I'm going to go down there and I'm going to bow before God. Help him to say, tell, I'm just going to tell him, I'm telling him now, but I was being preached out there today that no one suffers the consequences of their sin. That's a lie. I have great paranoia, scars, and hurts in my life. 
earth rules. That's why all the teaching of men, you better put over there in a category by itself. And whatever comes from heaven, you better adopt it. Because you know what? I don't know whether you've noticed or not, but we ain't going to be here very long. Father and I can't believe it, but it's up to Lloyd and Harriet's today. They've been married 56 years. Lloyd and Harriet Spots. Lloyd said, it seems like just yesterday. He says, yeah, Mother and I have been married 21 years. It just seems like, like that. And then Lloyd and I got to kidding about how we both liked older women. Stupid guy stuff, you know. Heaven's where it's really at. Our Father, who art in heaven. Prayer is not an earth thing. Prayer can't be taught. Jesus in all the scriptures never goes to any more teaching about prayer than what we have right here. All of the apostles, they never set out, Peter, Paul, Peter, they never set out to go teaching about prayer. In fact, what the scriptures have recorded for us about prayer, in almost every case about prayer, you'll notice that when these guys were praying, or whatever happened, God broke in on the scene, because most of the prayers were not, here God, here I am, look at me. It was considering something else, and they was praying for God's will to be done. about two guys in a cold, dark, dreary prison down there. Oh, help God, let me out. God, help get me out. The Bible says they were down there singing praises to God. <laughs> How about the time them boys got all beat up for preaching the gospel? got warned never to ever say anything again. They got beat up two times for it. And when the last time they got turned loose, they got out there and the scriptures makes this statement. They were rejoicing because they had considered themselves worthy to suffer for Jesus. That's a little different mentality that's going around today, isn't it? I submit to you, my brothers and sisters, that they had a prayer life that was secret, that wasn't needs oriented, and it had something to do with what they captured in prayer just in those very first statements, our Father who art in heaven. Their minds was warped. <laughs> Their minds was warped right. They were warped with a heavenly vision. They were warped with a kingdom perspective. They were warped for Christ instead of for self. Uh, now, I don't know how long I'm going to be your pastor. I don't know how long I'm going to live. I don't know how long you're going to like me. I don't even know if you do like me. I don't know none of that stuff. Maybe here a year, maybe two, maybe forever. But I want to tell you this. Nothing else. If I can somehow encourage, help, inspire, teach, preach, beat, whatever it takes <laughs> to get you all to slow down, get off of materialistic, worldly pace of living to get you to spend some time in secret and the Holy Spirit begin to lead you into prayer and draw you into prayer so that you draw closer to Christ. I, I would really be happy. I would really, I would, uh, that would make that 
that would fill me up. That would make me feel like somebody. How many, of, how many people like to feel like somebody and have worth? If as a pastor that could happen here, I would take that personally. I would feel like I had some worth and value. Most of you already have enough money to live on, so working overtime is not going to. How many of you already discovered, too, that while a little bit of special offerings and things you've given hasn't altered your life one bit? How many of you discovered that? How many of you have gone hungry since giving an extra whatever you got, gave? Or whatever you're putting in the Jesus film, or whatever you, we, we, you all gave? for Diane to get her car and I took that money to Shirley Whitmore. She was so appreciative. She was so appreciative. I wish all of you could have been me to give her that money. And I didn't say this is for me. I said to all the people Brookside Wesleyan Church loved you Shirley and they wanted you to have this. It's not much but at least it's something. I said the same thing to her and I said y'all. How many of you have just what little bit of extra giving you've given how many of you have really been hurting since then? How many of you gone hungry? Has it altered your life a great deal? Are you really hurting? But I know some people that have been helped. Now, if you haven't been hurt and they've been helped, I think that's pretty good. Amen? I just think, I just am foolish enough to believe that it's pleasing to the Lord. I'm also foolish enough to think that we ought to sacrifice even a little bit sometimes to help someone else. Ouch. Say ouch. Say ouch. But I think it needs to be done. All right, let's sing. You ready to sing? Well, Gracie, you don't have to sing. I'm picking the song. I'm picking the first song. <coughs> Let me see what I picked. <laughs> you going to play, baby? Yeah, I want you to play. Well, I don't know either one of those songs. Do you all know 374, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah? Huh? Anybody know it? Kaylee does. Can't follow her. <laughs> 